In modern, overcrowded, brightly lit Britain, there is a strange paradox in our thinking about ghosts. We deny their existence, and at the same time, we are afraid of them. I was reminded of these words from the Reader's Digest Folklore, Myths and Legends book when I visited the building that not very long ago topped a list of the UK's most haunted heritage sites, said to be home to at least five phantoms. Come with me as I uncover the dark deeds, sinful secrets and haunted happenings at the heart of Aston Hall, Birmingham. A magnificent Jacobean mansion near the centre of Birmingham, Aston Hall was built by Sir Thomas Holt between 1618 and 1635. Sir Thomas was rich, clever and ran a successful estate. He was High Sheriff of Warwickshire in 1599 and was knighted by King James I in 1603. Unfortunately, he was also an unscrupulous man, a snob who was vain, violent and vindictive. He was one of the first knights to purchase a baronetcy, an hereditary knighthood that cost £1,095 in 1611, equivalent to £248,000 today, allowing him to take precedence over nearly all the other gentry in Warwickshire. The money that was raised from the sale of this new honour was deemed by the Crown to be a voluntary contribution to the costs of peacekeeping in Ulster, which is why the Red Hand was added to the Holt family crest. Over the years, however, local tradition saw the development of a new story to explain the bloody hand, and claiming it had been added as a badge of disgrace, Sir Thomas was said to have murdered his cook in a ferocious attack. And whilst we know that the Red Hand has nothing to do with any crime committed by Sir Thomas, there is a strong possibility that he did, in fact, brutally murder his cook, an offence there is only a record of because of the nastily litigious nature of Sir Thomas himself. It was in 1606 that Sir Thomas took a gentleman named William Asquick to court to sue him for making the slanderous statement Sir Thomas Holt took a cleaver and hit his cook with the same cleaver upon the head and clave his head that one side thereof fell upon one of his shoulders and the other side upon the other shoulder. Sir Thomas won his case, but Asquick appealed, and the King's Bench found in his favour, judging that what Asquick had said couldn't have been slander, because it is not averred that the cook was killed, the party may yet be living. At no stage did Asquick deny that he had made the claim, and at no point did Sir Thomas deny that he had hit his cook in the head with a cleaver. No one seems to have made any effort to determine if the poor cook was alive or not. And this is probably why the ghost of this poor man followed Sir Thomas to Aston Hall, staying near the kitchens, a wraith-like reminder of the terrible temper that ended his life. Now we know something of the character of Sir Thomas, it won't be a surprise to learn that he tried to ruin his eldest son, Edward, because he didn't approve of his choice of wife. The king himself had to intervene and even then, Sir Thomas was never reconciled with Edward, who died following civil war skirmishes in Oxford in 1643. Edward's brother-in-law gave an elegy which commented on the pain and sorrow caused to him by 19 years of his father's barbarous rage. Still, it seems Edward was lucky as legend has it that Sir Thomas treated one of his unfortunate daughters much worse. Sir Thomas had at least 16 children, though only the names of six are known, the others recorded sadly as other children died young. One of these other children is said to have been a daughter who fell in love with a man Sir Thomas did not believe was suitably advantageous to his ambitions. As a punishment, he locked the poor girl in a small room at the top of Aston Hall. She was provided with food through a hole in the wall, dying some years later, either of a broken heart or of starvation. She remains at the hall, however, in the form of a grey lady and is regularly seen walking around the upper floors of the building and through the aptly named 
and elaborately decorated long gallery, her appearance so solid that she is mistaken for an actor in period dress until she fades from sight. As an interesting aside, I found a slightly different version of this tale in a query lodged by the folklorist John Simmons Udall with the Notes and Queries publication in 1872. Mr Udall was told that the lady who was locked up was the wife of the baronet who had been suspected of having an affair with a servant. He also mentions that the rattling of chains can be heard at the hall along with other unpleasant things and hopes that the ghost has been laid to rest. Unfortunately, based on the still regular sightings of the Grey Lady, it doesn't appear that she has found peace. And still the spirits come. A young manservant named Dick was accused of stealing bread, and rather than face Sir Thomas's well-documented violent rage, hanged himself from the rafters in what is now known as Dick's Garret. This low attic room was the servants' quarters, and I was surprised at how cold and claustrophobic it felt in there. Despite the white walls and ceiling, a newer addition, the room would have been open to the roof at the time of Dick's death. There is no brightness to the place, and there's an inescapable sadness, a loneliness to the room. Dick's ghost is seen there even now, sometimes quietly pacing the room, sometimes re-enacting his tragic end. The presence of a young girl has been felt in the old stable block, with some saying she is the victim of a murder. A green lady, thought to be Sir Thomas's housekeeper, has been seen in the Great Hall and the servants' quarters. Violent deaths were also suffered at Aston Hall in December 1643, when a parliamentarian column was sent to destroy the property. Sir Thomas was a royalist, the king had stayed at Aston Hall the year before, and when he lost property in Birmingham and suffered plundering, he asked that Aston Hall be garrisoned for protection and was provided with 40 royalist musketeers to secure the place. The parliamentarians controlled most of Warwickshire at this time and couldn't stand for this threat to their position. They bombarded the property with cannon, causing damage that can still be seen on the balustrade of the Great Stairs today, and assaulted the hall on foot, losing some of their own men, killing still more of the Royalist Musketeers and Sir Thomas's staff, taking prisoners and pillaging a good amount of food, money and silverware. Perhaps some of the shadowy figures that are seen and some of the sinister sounds that are heard today at Aston Hall are echoes of this cruel Christmas Day conflict, when the walls shook with cannon fire and the air was thick with smoke, sulphur and screams. Despite the generations of his family who followed and the other unrelated owners and occupiers of Aston Hall, the imprint left on it by the man who commissioned its building, Sir Thomas Holt, is undeniable. It is his pride, his arrogance, his conspicuous affluence that put up the soaring towers of this place and caused so much unhappiness to the people who lived there with him. Walking through the hall, hearing every creaking floorboard, seeing every shadowy corner, feeling every cold breeze, reminded me that a building is more than bricks and mortar. It is a living, breathing entity where the past intertwines with the present, its ghosts and spectral echoes providing a poignant reminder of Aston Hall's fascinating, harrowing history. <laughs>